Hello everyone and welcome to Sun Up. I'm Lyndall Stout. This week we're taking a look back at some of our favorite segments featuring natural resource topics. Our OSU experts have packed in some great information. We hope you enjoy the best of Naturally Speaking. In Oklahoma, the optimum time to cut native grass for hay is the first part of July, uh, before July 15th. This will optimize the amount of total forage with the quality. If you wait till after July 15th, the quality of the forage starts declining rapidly. And if you uh, cut the hay in June, then you're not going to get a lot of production. There's just not going to be a lot of biomass. You're not going to have a lot of bales, although the quality would be very high. Some of the producers will try to cut their native grass fields early, like late May even, but certainly into early June, so that they can get a second cutting in August. Uh, and so that first cutting, you end up with a really high quality uh, hay product but you don't get very much qu uh, quantity at all. Usually biomass production is, is still low until late June, so you don't get a lot of bales. And that second cutting, you get a lot of volume, but the quality is, is very poor. It might only be 25% of what it would have been uh, back in late June. So neither cutting is very good. The first one is, is high quality, but low quantity. The second one is just the opposite. So. To really uh, optimize, we recommend that people cut uh, the very first part of July. Research has shown that multiple cuttings on native grasslands can uh, shift the plant community to something that's undesirable from, from a hay standpoint, also from a wildlife standpoint. But additionally, if you're cutting the field in May or June, this is the peak reproduction season for lots of wildlife, including ground nesting birds, uh, small mammals like rabbits. This is when deer fawns are on the ground and are vulnerable. It's also the time of year when things like box turtles are actively moving around. So if you're out cutting hay during May or June, you're going to cause a lot of wildlife mortality and you're not going to uh, optimize the, 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 the quantity and quality of the, the forage that you could be cutting for hay. So in addition to the, uh, the the, wild, the wildlife benefits, there's also a lot of insect benefits uh, and people are increasingly concerned about pollinators. Pollinators, of course, are critically important for our food supply. They also pro provide lots of ecological services and so things like uh, native bees and uh, butterflies and moths that are, are really important uh, beneficial insects for pollinating our food crops. A lot of these uh, insects are in the larval stage during early summer. Also, for the uh, insects that are already adults, they're, they're feeding because they're actively using these fields for nectar sources. So there's just a lot of negatives uh, that you need to think about when you're, you're mowing during that peak blooming period of early summer. A big part of habitat management for white-tailed deer is increasing food resources. But typically, landowners are focused mostly on food resources during hunting season. But that's actually not when deer have high, the highest nutritional demands. You need to think about the full calendar year, particularly food that is going to be available during the early summer when they're developing antlers or when they're uh, nursing fawns. These are when they really have incredibly high nu nutrition demands. And so if you want to increase food resources during the whole year, you need to think about more than just a food plot. Do this through creating forested openings or thinning our forest. Uh, a, a simple way is to pick areas on your property that are eastern red cedar. Usually those areas have very little in the understory for whitetails. In those spots, we can just cut the cedar down and burn, which is what's been done here. And we'll get a flush of important deer forages like uh, ragweed, 
uh, partridge, pea, pokeweed, and, and then if you just maintain that with fire, maybe once every three to seven years, you can keep that in a, in a composition that'll really be beneficial for deer and meet their nutritional needs. You can also go into oak forest and thin those, either mechanically cutting them and then burning or using some selective herbicide to create uh, openings in the forest and try to get that canopy cover down so that more sunlight reaches the forest floor and you get that response of food resources. So think about nutrition beyond just the hunting season. Think about what deer actually are consuming throughout the year, which is mostly forbs, broadleaf plants, and vines and shrubs. Uh, they don't, do not consume a lot of grasses, so if your property is dense grass, you might think about practices like prescribed fire that can get more broadleaf plants on the property. Shinnery oak occurs in a pretty small part of the country. It's in western Oklahoma, uh, throughout the Texas Panhandle, and in eastern New Mexico. And it's a low-growing clonal oak. So it typically stays less than waist tall, um, and it's an important wildlife plant. So there's a lot of conservation value, especially for bobwhite and wild turkey. And it produces a very large acorn, but they usually don't persist very long into the fall. Wildlife and insects consume them. And then when it leaves out later on in the spring, it has a very irregular, uh, jagged leaf margin. It's slightly glossy and dark green. And this plant is highly adapted to fire. When it's burned, it comes, uh, resprouts rapidly from the roots, and within two or three years, the plant is back to the structure it was before the fire took place. So in addition to providing acorns for food, uh, a lot of birds actually eat the catkins off of these oak and particularly they use it for cover, both for cover from predation but also for thermal cover uh, to shield them from the midday sun. A landowner might have an interest in trying to get shinnery back on the landscape for the cover it provides and also for the food resources it provides. And so we're hoping to be able to provide some uh, best management practices to landowners in the future, but right now we really are kind of at ground zero. We really don't know how to grow it. So last year we started with collecting hundreds of acorns and we're uh, you know, experimenting with different stratifications and different um, light levels to see how we can best grow these in greenhouses to transplant them back into the sandy soils. If a landowner wants to do shinnery restoration, how can they go about that? So we're partnering with the Forest Research Station in Idabel through OSU uh, to learn about acorn germination and survival, rhizome survival, and then also about transplanting it back into these sandy soils. Well, it's finally fall and people are out hunting for white-tailed deer and at least for land owners and managers that are interested in harvesting large antler deer, a question that always comes up is, should I cull inferior antlered bucks to have larger antlered bucks? And in a free-ranging white-tailed deer population, that is deer that are not enclosed, that can move about across the landscape, the answer is no. There is no benefit to you to cull what you think are inferior antlered bucks. Research has clearly shown that you can have no influence on this at a landscape level. And there's several reasons why that is. The first is that often we make mistakes in judging what is inferior. Deer often have an injury during that summer and they'll have an, uh, an antler deformity um, and that will make a hunter think that the deer is inferior when in fact it's just an injury. Also during drought years or when deer have poor nutrition, antler size can be much less uh, than what that deer's genetic potential is. Uh, often hunters want to cull spike bucks, but spikes are typically deer that were just born late the previous year and, and they could have tremendous genetic potential for large antlers. And finally, does are contributing 50% of the genetic material that controls antler development. And you cannot look at a doe and tell what kind of genetic material she's passing on for antler development. So when you put all this together, what it means is you really cannot control genetics in a free-ranging white-tailed deer herd. So if you want to control 
antler size, there are two things that you can influence, and that is provide a lot of nutrition throughout the whole calendar year, and then also delaying harvesting of bucks until they're at least four or five years old, because most bucks will not reach their antler potential until somewhere between five and seven years old. So focus on nutrition and age of the deer, and don't worry about the genetics in a free range and whitetail herd. So a lot of producers are curious about what impacts their haying operations might have on wildlife. So the peak uh, fawning for Oklahoma is usually late May, early June, and that is a, a really vulnerable time for deer fawns if you're, if you're cutting hay during that period. That's also that May-June period is a really uh, important time of the year for rabbit production and also a lot of ground nesting birds. Most of those ground nesting birds are finished by early to mid-July. And by that time, most deer fawns are up and mobile. Uh, rabbit production is generally tailing off. And also another vulnerable species, which is the box turtle, which gets hit and killed a lot of times by mowing equipment. By July, when it's getting hot, they tend to be underground more. So if you can delay haying until mid-July, you're going to miss a lot of the wildlife that would be susceptible to uh, mortality. Also, that is a good time to optimize hay quality and quantity on, on, native, on native hay fields. But some producers want to cut that native hay field multiple times during the summer. So they'll cut in June and then maybe later in, in the summer. But the, a problem with that is uh, research has shown that cutting hay on native fields multiple times that tends to lead to undesirable plant species long term, and that's not uh, an ideal situation for a native hay field. So we generally recommend that producers only cut native grass once a year for hay production. So waiting a little bit later into the summer, uh, you can get a lot of uh, tonnage that's high quality, but also minimize the negative impacts to wildlife. Now there's also the situation of just mowing a field, a native field, where you don't, you're not actually interested in taking the hay off, but you're just wanting to knock the, the grass cover back, maybe for fire prevention or aesthetics or brush control. So if, if that's your objective, when is the ideal time to do this? So a lot of people want to do it at the end of the summer, growing, going into the fall. But unfortunately, if you do that, you've removed all the cover for, for that site. So species like bobwhite, uh, rabbits, and a lot of wintering sparrows really don't have a lot of use of that field throughout the whole winter. So like the field I'm standing in today, it's been barren all winter. We're entering spring now, and it's had very little wildlife use. Whereas if the producer had delayed that mowing until the end of the winter, um, they could have met their objective of brush control. They could have even timed it to take advantage of, you know, right before our fire season, which is typically late winter, and still provided wildlife cover throughout all the fall and most of the winter. Now there's going to be situations where you probably have to mow in the fall or you have to cut hay earlier in the summer. Uh, it's not the optimum time for wildlife. But one thing you might consider, if you've got multiple pastures and large acreages, just attempt to leave some cover during the summer for nesting and some cover during the winter for quail and rabbits and sparrows. Uh, even if you have to mow or hay some, if you've got some cover on your property during those years, you can still have wildlife and hay production. Typically, we see this disease pop up in the late summer, and there's actually several viruses that have very similar symptoms that are often lumped together and called blue tongue. Blue tongue is one of them, or one of the groups, but there's also a group of diseases called epizootic hemorrhagic disease, and these are all usually lumped together under a group called hemorrhagic diseases, and they have very similar symptoms. Um, often you'll see deer acting uh, feverish or they have lethargy, they're hanging around water sources, or they'll have abscesses on their mouth, or they'll have a swollen tongue, hence the name blue tongue. Fortunately, this disease is not transmittable to humans, uh, and while livestock 
can get it, usually the symptoms are very, very mild, so it's not considered a threat to livestock. So it's, it's really just impacting the deer population. Lots of carcasses, fresh carcasses, in late summer, July, August, or September, or if you see deer hanging around water sources and, the, and they just don't act like they feel very good, they might be uh, sweaty, feverish, or they won't flee when they see you, then you can call your local county conservation officer with ODWC and just report that so that they have an idea of where those outbreaks might be occurring. But beyond that, there's really nothing that a landowner needs to be concerned about. The disease is not a threat to humans. The only issue is if you see a lot of secondary bacterial infections from abscesses around the mouth, you know, that that animal might not be fit for consumption. But as far as the virus, uh, it's not a threat to a human. Um, you might see lower deer populations for a while. You know, sometimes we'll uh, see up, you know, 25% or even greater reduction in, in animals in, in isolated populations. So it can take a few years before the deer herd recovers from that. When people think of habitat management for white-tailed deer, they're often thinking about food resources and they'll often neglect the cover needs of deer. Cover is important for several different reasons. They use it both to stay cool or warm in inclement weather, but a big reason they use cover is just for security, um, to stay hidden and to not feel pressured from predation, especially from the uh, human presence that might be on a property. So a lot of forested properties in the eastern part of the state have a really open understory. The, the canopy's closed and there's really not a, a developed shrub layer. And in these forests, cover can often be very limited. And especially on smaller properties, this can have big implications on how many deer actually stay on your property. So if you're trying to keep more deer on the property, like during hunting season, you need to really think about cover and where it occurs on, across your property. If you don't have it, you can easily create it. Um, the first thing you need to do is just to make forested openings, like the one behind me. We've went into a, an area that was mostly eastern red cedar and we just simply cut them all down, allowed sunlight to come into that area, and we got an abundant amount of uh, tall grasses that actually provide cover, particularly during the summer. And around the edge, we've fallen a lot of trees and we, instead of piling those up and burning them, we've left those treetops and those treetops actually serve as cover for white-tailed deer. So you can use herbicide or mechanical means to, to create these forested openings. Um, a simple way is just to take a chainsaw and, and cut these trees off at three to four foot height. Uh, and what we want to do is what's called a hinge cut. Now on this tree, I didn't do a hinge cut. Just to illustrate <clears throat> the difference, I actually took a notch out and then just cut the tree. And of course it breaks cleanly like we typically cut a tree and then this falls off. So it, it does provide cover, uh, but not as much as if we cut the tree on a hinge. So compare that last cut to this hinge cut where I did not take a notch out of the, the front side of the tree where it's gonna fall. I just cut through the tree until it pivoted over. And so now the tree stays connected to this uh, stem and it's gonna stay off the ground and provide a little bit more cover that deer can back into, especially with a cedar like this that has a lot of limbs and the needles, which will stay on here for a little while. It provides really good thermal cover for, for white-tailed deer and, and, and also helps them feel secure on the property. Now, we can also do this to trees that actually can provide not only cover, but also food. This is an American elm, also hinged, and oftentimes when there's some of this cambium still left attached, this tree will stay alive for maybe a couple of years. And not only is it providing the cover now, but the deer will actually uh, browse on the leaves that are now made available on this tree. And the tree will continue to put leaves out for some time. So it's also providing some food resources um, for white-tailed deer. So think about the cover resources you have on your property and the different ways that you can use uh, to create additional cover resources, whether it be mechanical like hinge cutting or herbicide, and then you can follow up with prescribed fire to help keep those areas open and dense and shrubby long term. And I think these tips will help you keep more deer on your property and help those deer really feel secure.
With the recent wildfires in the western part of the state, some pond owners are wondering what the impact is of ash washing into their pond. I have not seen this to be a major cause of mortality of fish. It's possible, but not terribly likely. Uh, but you might want to keep an eye and see what's happening on your fish populations uh, if you, more closely than usual. This is also an opportunity to consider uh, visiting with your local fire department to see if they have any ideas about how your pond might be better prepared for use as a water source in fighting wildfires. They may need better access, there may be ways to set up dry hydrants, but uh, whatever you do it needs to be coordinated with your local fire department. Springtime is a great time to be thinking about your ponds. Perhaps you don't spend a lot of time at the pond, and this uh, might be a good way to establish the habit of walking the edges of your pond and looking at the dam and the spillway to see if everything is in good condition or if anything is changing that you might uh, benefit from catching early before a problem develops into a very uh, full-blown and expensive kind of situation. Is your shoreline having any issues with erosion? Do you see any shallowing of the shoreline at any point, any wave erosion going on? On your dam and your spillway, is there any uh, indication of burrowing animals? Now walking across the dam is the easy way to do it, but if you really want to see what's going on, you need to get down on the face of the dam and walk the fa both faces of the dam to look for signs of burrowing. You can't always see mounds, uh, with muskrat and beaver, they're going to have underwater entrances uh, as they get into their burrowing activity that will be pretty much invisible. So look for any signs of uh, slides or disturbance of the vegetation. And if you see that, you really don't want to let this sort of situation go for several years until you have a very expensive repair issue. The other thing you could be looking for would be plant coverage, aquatic plant life in the pond. We'd like to see from a fishing point of view about 20% coverage, 20 to 30% coverage, that's considered good. But if you're seeing a new plant that's coming on fast or uh, anything that's growing progressively uh, to cover more and more of the pond year after year, try to get after it, get it identified, bring a sample into the county extension office as you're fishing the pond, if you're fishing your pond, you might try to keep mental notes on what you're seeing. If you see fish that you don't, aren't familiar with, uh, try to get some pictures and get those identified. Make sure that the fish are not becoming overabundant and scrawny, overpopulated fish populations. Uh, there are things we can do about that in terms of perhaps uh, adding some additional bass in or doing other things. So take a more proactive approach to pond management. See if you don't enjoy your pond more and find some new uses for it that you hadn't considered. Fish kills are uh, one of the most uh, dramatic and unpleasant things that can happen to you as a pond owner. They involve basically the fish suffocating from lack of dissolved oxygen. Oxygen is very scarce in ponds and uh, there are a variety of things that can use up that oxygen and the fish will just go belly up on you in large numbers in very short order. Oxygen is both produced by plants and can be used by plants or the decomposition of dead plants. If a pond is uh, perhaps deeper than average and we get into fall weather and the pond turns over. The uh, organic matter in the bottom of the pond goes through a decomposition process in which oxygen is also absorbed. The main source of oxygen in a pond is photosynthesis during the daylight hours by either submerged higher plants or phytoplankton or algae in the water column. Uh, photosynthesis produces oxygen during the daylight hours. Then the whole process reverses at night and uh, plants use uh, some oxygen. Thankfully, not as generally as much as they produce, but they are users of oxygen at night. 
There's several different things you need to watch out for on a regular basis, especially during the warm months of the year and as we get into fall. The first would be an overly green appearance to the water. That would indicate that the phytoplankton bloom in the water column is getting too dense. Another common problem to watch out for in some ponds would be the takeover of floating plants such as duckweed. You never want to allow your pond to be totally blanketed because that shades out the, any photosynthesis down in the water column and the plants may be perfectly happy on top producing lots of oxygen but it's going off into the atmosphere. You want your photosynthesis down in the water column itself so do not allow your, your pond to become coated by uh, or covered up by a floating plant. If your pond is deeper than average, it may likely have stratified into a, a cold oxygen, uh, zero oxygen layer on the bottom and a warm oxygen rich layer on the top. As the temperature difference decreases, you, uh, there's no longer a separation based on temperature. That strong cold wind comes through, turns over the entire pond, and your fish are, are, can go belly up uh, in a matter of uh, an hour or less. Like everything else in pond management, it, you need to be ahead of the curve. Get to know what's going on in your pond. Be a regular visitor to your pond and look and see if anything different is happening. If it grew a lot this year, it's probably not going to grow less next year. It's probably going to keep growing. So don't let those kinds of things, year to year trends, catch up with you and cause problems with you in terms of oxygen or just overabundance uh, in a, an ugly situation where it's a uh, pond can become unfishable or unsightly. That'll do it for us this week. Remember you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.